afternoon and welcome to the Help Wrap. Hi, Carla. How are you doing? Hi, Carolyn. How are you doing? I'm hanging in here. It's uh, Saturday. and uh, These are crazy times that we're living in. I think uh, you said it yesterday. Things are red hot. Red hot. And, you know, we're going to talk about several states that are just basically on fire. Uh, I was looking at a map the other day, a couple of days ago, and everybody was in like red, orange, or yellow in just maybe three states that had not been affected. So, you know, it's unbelievable of what's going on and how we've re-entered society and people just think they can just rip their mask off. They don't have to social distance anymore and they can just go on with life like it was before. But we're in a red alert. Absolutely. In fact, you can see the map. This is a map of the United States. And the red, you know, I looked at this map when Hillard first showed it to us and I thought, you know, this looks like the virus itself floating through the air. But you can see the hot spots. Um, we are focused on a couple of states today that we want to talk about. But there's a second map I want you to look about. Look at this one, Carla. This actually looks at the new daily cases, and these numbers are like crazy. And and you can see you're in Tennessee. You guys have seen a plus fifty percent increase. I'm in South Carolina. We have seen a plus one hundred percent increase. Yesterday was the first time I actually remember. By the way, my governor saying wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask. Remember, we were one of the first states to open back up and we're seeing the surge. Uh, we were one of the last states to close. I missed that part. We were last to close and then we were the first to open up. And while there has been no official word, I think if you listen to some of the doctors out here, they're, they're really, uh, it makes you say we need to be back where we started a few weeks ago, which is to stay at home. Um, if you're heading to Miami Beach for the 4th of July weekend or you had planned to, hope you have a beach front view because the beach is closed. The mayor this morning said he's not going to allow the beach in Miami to be open. You're seeing uh, so many flip flops happening as it relates to decisions that people made earlier, those in leadership and now listening to public health. And so Florida is a hot spot that people are watching. It's really our three big states, right? Florida. California, Texas. And what do you have on Texas, Carla? Well, um, we have a lot going on in Texas. One thing that I'm very curious about, um, a lot of things have been closed there as well. However, and we're going to talk about this later with our doctor on call. However, there's certain places that uh, remain open. Um, Texas, deep in the heart of Texas, the, the cases have just gone up tremendously. And, you know, Texas was basically one of those first states, too, that, that did the reentry. Um, but Governor Abbott, you know, he's telling people you're going to have to learn how to coexist at home. They're saying that elective surgeries or if you, there's any surgery that needs to be done, you're going to have to wait like it was. Remember when we were in stage one um, because hospital beds are, are just filling up uh, to capacity. Um, the bars, they're talking about um, bars closed. You can go to restaurants for takeout and that sort of thing. What's happening with the bars, and we're seeing this in Nashville as well, where some people got citations. Um, people go to a bar, they like to sit close. They like to talk and have conversation with people. That means they're not going to wear their mask if they are consuming of their favorite beverage and sitting there close talking to buddies. So um, that's one of the things that's going on, not only in Texas, but um, across the country. But um, Governor Abbott says, you know, restaurants have to go back to half capacity. And so if you are, you know, you can still patronize your restaurant by going and ordering takeout. Uh, I was telling you, my friend yesterday, Renee, was here in Nashville and she was going to a restaurant. I was like, you know, go to restaurants right now. And she pulled up. She said, it is packed in here. So she decided to get takeout. And that's happening across the country. You know, my daddy used to say common sense ain't common. And that is so true. But I, I feel a little bit of frustration because you and I know we've been spent we've spent the last 11 weeks uh, longer than that, actually telling people you got to wear that mask. You got to have the distance. Yesterday, they had the first coronavirus task force meeting that they've had in what is it, two months, I think. Mm -hmm. And and our nation's doctor, as I like to call him, Dr. Falke, said, look, 
you have a personal responsibility, but you also have a social responsibility. That means you have a responsibility to your brother and your sister. Yes, you are your brother and your sister's keeper. And, and we have to put the mask on and keep the distance to keep other people safe. It's, it's just that simple. I feel like we're, we're saying the same thing, but we clearly still need to say it. I do want to say a couple quick um, good mornings and, and hellos to some folks who are joining us. Um, Benita Walker, who joins us each week, and we're happy to have her. Carletta Reed hey. is with <laughs> Reggie Marshall. Yeah, Reggie Marshall's out there. Um, Cardell Winfrey, yeah, he's out oh, there. Oh, that's my little Lynn. brother. Yep, Sterling Wright, lots of good people. Look at Chef Gabby. Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> we're happy to have everybody on board. Here's what I'm going to ask of everybody who is watching. Uh, and and I, I ask two things. Don't believe what we say. We're not doctors, okay? We're trying to pass along what we think is the most sound information. But go back and look at the very first show that we did that had four experts, including Dr. Hildreth on it, who said, you know, here's what we need to do, people. Here's what's going to happen. And, and, and watch and see things have happened as they have said. The confusion that we're seeing now, the pandemic of misinformation, so we're going to try our hardest to continue on this mission that we feel like we've been set on to set the record straight. And I know we also got a doctor in house today that's from Texas where yes. it's hot, red hot. Right. And, you know, speaking of Texas again, you know, now um, as big as Texas is and, and business and barbecues and all of this that people will be doing on the 4th of July. That's just just can't happen. Um, when I saw that the Texas Restaurant Association said that, OK, we're OK with this. We don't like it, but we're OK with it because people are getting sick. And that came straight from the president saying we understand it. We don't like it. But now we need to close down. Absolutely. Well, let's go ahead and get our doctor in here because I know we both have lots of questions for him. OK. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to out if it is what it hey, is. Hey, Dr. Reed. Well, how are you doing? I Good, I'm doing fine. Okay, good. This is Dr. Brian Reed, and he is a practicing family physician in um, Houston. He's also the chair of the clinical science department there at the University of Houston at the uh, College of Medicine. So welcome to the Health Wrap. Welcome. We, we know you're really busy now. Um, you know, one of the things that Carolyn and I were, were talking about was what if, because we know that there's a rise in the hospital beds and a lot of they're saying now no elective surgery. So we know those beds have to be set aside for people with coronavirus. Um, can you give us um, an outlook and tell us what happens, um, you know, if you get sick and what do we need to do? So, you know, that's a great question. So we hit 100% capacity of our ICUs here in the Texas Medical Center, and it's among the world's largest groups of hospitals together. Um, it, it, and uh, we do have some additional room or surge capacity, meaning we're able to convert some of the areas that are typically ICUs into space for people that are that sick. So there's still room in case people are you know, sick, if they're not able to breathe, if they're not able to eat or feed themselves. I mean, the hospital is still the place where they would receive that level of care. The reason why we're sounding the alarms is that, you know, if the trend continues, we'll pass beyond, you know, our ability to take care of those individuals in these extra rooms and have to come up with additional uh, resources or send people that come to the hospital to other regions or send them out, you know, to where there's additional beds or additional space. So for those though, who, you know, we, we keep hearing, uh, we talked about this, you know, asymptomatics and pre-symptomatic. I mean, so just you're home and you think that in fact, you might have come in contact because now we're hearing that the tracking and the tracing isn't, is, isn't living up to what folks had hoped it would live up to. But what can families do as they're watching and saying, how do I keep my loved ones safe in the event we have inadvertently been exposed to someone? So that's, that's another good question. And that, that's a very common scenario. So at the University of Houston College of Medicine, we have a federally qualified health center on campus, the Lone Star Circle of Care. And that's what we've seen. We've seen individuals that have gone to work, been where they're supposed to be, and come into contact with a coworker that has tested positive. 
So then they get usually some sort of notification from their employee employer that, hey, we had this happen. You know, you may want to consider getting tested or they actually do some testing on site. So some of our more conscientious patients are thinking, well, if I was potentially exposed and now I'm finding out several days later and there's a pre-symptomatic phase, let me go get tested. Perhaps my family should get tested too. So we've seen that where, you know, someone's exposed at work, they come in a couple of days later, they test positive, and the next thing you know, family members are coming in. Some of them have symptoms, some of them don't. Um, I think it's good to get tested. That way, you know, we're able to isolate or remove people that could potentially be spreading it to others. Where people can get tested has become a challenge because the demand has gone up. There's still free testing locations, at least in, I know, Houston and Harris County. And those are typically advertised. Or you can find them online. But some of the private pharmacies or uh, the you know, larger pharmacies like CVS and Walgreens offer testing. If you have a usual place of care, primary care physician's office oftentimes do as well. ER would be sort of a last resort or hospital would be a last resort to go get tested. But that's if you're really sick, like if you're having trouble with breathing or haven't been able to eat or drink for a couple of days, you know, that's where you would need a higher level of care. But if yeah, you nope. think you have mild symptoms, do you do like we tell people during the flu, you see, you treat the symptoms, you, you just focus on what, what is hurting or if you're coughing, you focus on that if it's not the extreme? Yeah, you're supposed to stay home. I mean, really from the day one, if you feel sick, stay home. I know that some people you know, have jobs that require them to show up in order to get paid, and that's been a barrier for some. There's no paid sick leave in some situations. But the messaging all along is if you are not feeling well, you need to stay home. And then, you know, most of us have mild infections. So most of the things that we're doing, if you do test positive, people are like, well, now what? There's no specific treatment for this. It's still, you know, for the sore throat, Tylenol, ibuprofen, warm teas, soup, you know, those home remedies that mom and grandma told us about. It's only if you are really to the point to where you know, you cannot breathe, you're having really trouble with breathing, or you've been in a situation where you've had lots of diarrhea, can't keep anything down, or, you know, lots of vomiting, and feel extremely weak, you know, that's when someone might require an IV. Um, my, my, you know, advice regarding, you know, how do you know if you're that short of breath, if you're not able to complete a sentence, if you're just talking to people, and you can't complete a sentence, you're really in bad shape. You may not have all the monitors at home, but if you're that short of breath to where you can't breathe to at least say two or three words together, you really need to go in and get get, get assessed. Uh, Dr. Reed, I wanted to ask you this. I know um, in Texas and in other places, there are some churches that have opened. I know that there are some graduations that are taking place. There was one in Miami yesterday where the priest told the students take your mask off while you're singing and speaking now singing um, dr hildreth our, our, from meharry has told us how this virus can just spread you know the six feet is for just everyday talking but people singing and you know that's a celebration of graduation we need to tell people we need to have some common sense i think no, I, I agree 100 percent. I mean, the people that I've seen in my office that have tested positive, that got it at work, said that, you know, before everyone was wearing a mask, they were just having a regular conversation with someone. And they had been trying to social distance or just keep, them, keep, keep themselves at least six feet away. And it was just sort of conversation. And they said, you know, so-and-so looked a little tired, but they really weren't coughing or anything so if you're going into a situation where, you know, there's singing, shouting, yelling, six feet apart is not going to be far enough, far enough apart because those respiratory droplets can spread up to 20 feet. Um, my, my church, and I'm, I'm Catholic, I mean, they just issued, I mean, they've been trying to social distance people that actually go to go to mass uh, in the pews. And they now said, you know, a mask is required because of concern about the spread. I myself have just been watching remotely. Um, <laughs> you know, I just haven't gone back. <laughs> you know? I don't blame you. Well, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but, uh, you know, often we try to play out strategically. Where Where is this going and how might this end? Do we see an end? 
Yeah, so this this is really at this time a um, you know public health crisis. It's not something that medicine can fix right now, but it is something that we can fix with individual behavior. Uh, you've seen this happen in other countries. They were on similar trajectories, but they wound up socially distancing, wearing masks, isolating individuals that were sick through contact tracing, identifying people that were sick, and then telling people that they came into contact with to stay home, and then the trajectory went down. They don't have any vaccines. They don't have any special medications. We have some promising medications for those that are in the hospital that are gravely ill to keep them alive. But for the rest of us with like mild symptoms and pre-symptomatic phases, I mean, there's nothing really to keep us from spreading it to somebody else other than staying away from others. So I know we're social beings. I know we like to fellowship. I know we like to gather. We do much better in the company of others. But until we start to see these cases go down, until we see evidence that there is less COVID-19 or coronavirus in our communities, these are the new rules to keep us safe. We have to wash our hands, we have to socially distance, and we have to use a mask when out in public or just stay home altogether if we don't need to go out. Well, thank you, Dr. Reed. We really appreciate all this information. And, and you say stay, stay, stay safe down there in Texas, and we'll be back in contact with you, okay? All right, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Dr. Reed, thank you so much. I tell you, Carla, it's a, it's a little frustrating. I mean, you really, you, you keep wondering what is the answer, what's the solution, what's the right way to say it to get people to do what we need to do, because this is not, it's not getting better. No, it, it's not, and you know, I just told someone yesterday, you wanna wear a mask, or do you wanna wear a ventilator? Good point. I love the uh, tweet that was sent out by uh, former Vice President's uh, um, daughter. Uh, she said, real men wear masks. And that was about <laughs> the extent of it. And I love that with his uh, walking, riding his, his, with his cowboy hat on. All right. So we've got more on this show ahead, right? What's coming up, Carla? Well, we have a story that um, we're pretty excited about because it's about a farmer who is helping out residents in a public housing community. And he's also a nurse. For public health. And so we don't <laughs> want to miss that. We'll be back after this message. To help protect others from COVID-19, DHEC encourages everyone to wear a mask or cloth face covering when in public. Make sure your mask covers your nose and mouth and you can breathe through it. Remember to clean your hands before and after putting on your mask. And try not to touch the mask or your face while wearing it. Don't use a mask on children under the age of two. And don't use surgical masks needed by healthcare workers. Help stop the spread. Visit scdhec.gov slash COVID-19. Hats off to our friends over at DHEC. They've been doing everything they can to get these messages out and get people to wash their hands and wear the mask and keep mm -hmm. you as well informed. So we really uh, owe them a debt of gratitude for being on board and, and wanting to, to continue messaging as we've been trying to do. So let's talk about the farmer in the city. Okay. <laughs> okay, the farmer in the city. All right. Well, you know, there's a lot of talk about the, the federal aid that people who have, have gotten that and it's helped people out during this pandemic season. So as things um, uh, continue, a lot of people are like, well, you know, uh, are we still going to be able to have money? Because, you know, a lot of this becomes political. So a lot of people who have been able to, some people actually have come out of the poverty line because they're making more by getting some of the federal aid. But we know that's not going to continue. And what's going to continue is that people are going to continue to be in food deserts. So we have a farmer. As I said, he's also a nurse. And he wants to do something about that. He wants to take pots and make promises and hopes and dreams to people by going into an area that's a food desert. And this could be uh, one way to help with nutrition. Uh, we know that a food desert by the USDA is an area that does not have fresh fruits or vegetables. Uh, people, there's not a grocery store in the area or it may not have fresh fruits and vegetables if it's in the area. It could just have things that are not nutritious. So we're going to visit with the farmer today here in Nashville at J.C. Napier Community. 
So that's what I don't want these children to go through. I keep hearing about kids being hungry and, you know, families being hungry. This is a way for me to help mitigate this. You want to help? Yeah. There you go. I'm a farmer as well as a registered nurse. I'm a house supervisor at St. Thomas Midtown Hospital in Nashville. And I'm here to help these children grow food, not just grow food for their uh, nutrition, but also grow food for their mental health as well. Good job. Talking to the kids about the production of agriculture. And tomatoes is, is an easy one. Uh, teaching them the, how many tomatoes and how, how many tomatoes will come from each plant, how many pounds, and the actual value of those tomatoes. Because the goal is for every balcony out here and every porch to have vegetables growing on it by the end of the summer. Yeah. Uh, they just asked me, is, "Why is my dad a nurse?" <laughs> but, but you know, mainly, you know, they they ask more about the farming aspect of everything. So, you know, we're basically I tell them what we're growing and tell them, you know, what we're doing for the community. Tomato capri salad because we got the fresh basil out here that we can grow we got fresh marinara also can do with the tomatoes and the peppers then we can have eggplant parmesan which is one of my favorites that go to plant right there so many different variety of foods i walked outside one day and it's this little bit of fig and then i come back outside and it is just beautiful that's the yard long green thing you want some of this yeah at my urban farm in antioch We've got 1,500 potted vegetables that we're growing ourselves. I'll have a total of about 3,500 before the season's over with. And these kids are eager to learn. And children at this age will absorb everything. Okay, you ready? Did you teach her? What's she supposed to do? We'll do it together. We used to have one grocery store here, and it was still low-grade. A lot of these people out here don't have cars. They don't have transportation. I'm lucky to be able to go to the grocery store and buy what I need. But a lot of people can only walk to this location. So if all you have around you is fattening foods, chips, cookies, cakes, and pies, and you don't really have any real groceries, then you have no choice but to, you know, be unhealthy. Just because, like, we don't like to go to the grocery store and buy things, and we know that it's fresh. And what he's doing is really is going to cut down on the crime out here that the kids will have less time doing dirt, dirty work, but actually doing dirty work. And we are just, you know, excited about what uh, this, this opportunity for this community uh, to build upon itself and, and, to, and to develop uh, for itself the hope that, that really is needed for them to move beyond uh, these concrete walls and so forth. Go around trying to find Duke anybody with this watermelon. Yeah, we gotta help ourselves to help each other. Can't help somebody else if you can't help yourself. You gotta talk to them. Nah, it ain't that one. You got tomatoes, you got carrots, and you got squash. Which one? Squash. He said he don't do the squash. How old are you? Never. Never seen a black woman. Never, never. But to see an actual black man come up here and bring this stuff and he's getting his hands dirty and he's actually building this stuff and to be able to see them grow lets you know that there's something else that we can do. We have green hands too. We don't just have drug hands. We got green hands. We can make other stuff grow. Great things grow. Hey. Well, I love that story, uh, Carolyn. It, it it was absolutely uh, a we'll joy. Have to check back in. We we, we will. We will. Um, the the gentleman in the red that talks a whole lot. The chef Sterling Wright. He was on Hell's Kitchen as a contestant, and you know he is just full of energy there with Reggie, Miss um, Adams, the resident, um, uh, Brian. Uh, Marshall, the son, everybody's just all hands on deck for those residents. And, and the pastor, you heard him say about this gives you something uh, from the pastor from Mount Air at a local a ch church over there. This gives you something besides just these brick walls. So we're going to be checking in with them. And uh, we like to tell them thank you for allowing us to come to their home. South Carolinians are asking, what can they do to stop the spread of COVID-19? Our response? 
answer the call. Through what's called contact tracing, DHEX trained contact tracers call everyone who has tested positive for COVID-19 and those who could have been exposed. All information is confidential, voluntary, and collected over the phone. This information helps us protect you, your loved ones, and your community. Answer the call to keep your community safe. Visit scdheck.gov slash COVID-19. Well, welcome back. I, I'm still, uh, you know, those urban gardens on the porch, it just makes so much sense. I love them. God bless them. God bless them for doing that. Yeah, I mean, it looks like a reality show. Yeah. A, a, a real reality show with something that's good. In with them before the end of the summer. It's a great story. Well, you ready to move? You ready to see? Some oh boy, you've been waiting for this. You know what? I'm gonna tell you. Miss Miss Walker likes to dance around like you do too. Okay. Well, Miss Walker and everybody else who's watching, we've had a lot of people joining us today. I saw uh, Shonda Hunter, who was with uh, uh, with us a couple of weeks ago with her son graduating and heading off to Morehouse. Um, I, I'm excited to, to see some of our regulars. But this next story. I'll confess, y'all, I was watching a little television and mm -hmm. saw this story about a couple that went to learn some dance moves. And they went to this studio down in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is kind of around my neck of the woods here. Um, Keisha B is the wonderful woman who runs that studio. And when I reached out to Keisha, she responded. And I want you to take a look at what she sent us. Hello, Health Rat family. This is Keisha Bridgman of Charlotte, North Carolina. I am the owner and instructor of Soca Fit USA, and it is a carnival style fun fitness experience. So basically, we are using the genre of soca music, um, putting it together with some aerobic moves and some cultural moves from the West Indies, and I've created this class to um, infuse this amazing experience for women and men, if they dare, <laughs> to, to come and be a part of. So basically, I started this class as a way to help others on their fitness journeys. Um, it was a, it's, I love to dance, and I feel like dancing is one of the best ways of working out, and this really is a helpful um, tool to do that. Um, also, it helps with your, it's a de-stressor as well. So one thing about soca music is that it's a happy kind of music. So basically, there are no sad soca songs. Um, a lot of my students come in and they're, if they're not feeling good and not having a good day, soca seems to de-stress them. I tell them to leave it on the floor and they end up having a better day and enjoying the rest of their evening. Um, and I've had many testimonies about how it makes them feel. Um, we also try to build confidence here in class. There's a lot of freedom of movement, body parts are moving that you probably never would move normally. So um, you don't, you do have to learn to be confident in that. So um, we, we encourage all of that here. And as well, we build stamina, we lose weight, and we, we also um, lose inches here. Um, so basically I wanted to show three moves that we use pretty much in class. Some, some of the basic moves are um, a wine, a juke, and a roll. So the wine, I'm gonna slow down first, do a slower pace of it. So you just swing your hips left to right, heel is coming forward. And when you speed this up, this is your wine. It's a figure eight with your hips. You're engaging your core, tightening your tush, and you're working your quads at the same time. Right, when you get comfortable, you can keep your feet planted and the waistline will move in a figure eight as well, same thing. All right, then there's the juke, opening your legs in second position, bending your knees slightly, and your hips going forward and back. Engaging your core again, tightening your quads, squeezing your tush, and the speed up the juke looks like this. All right, last one is a roll. Roll, slow motion roll, pushing back, knees are bending slightly forward, and you speed that up like a hula hoop. We remember hula hoop when we were kids. When you speed it up, looks like this. Good. And bring it together. Wine, 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 and juke. Juke, 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 and roll. Roll, roll, drop, up, up. Good. 
Thank you so much for having me here on Health Wrap. I appreciate you all. I hope to see you soon in a Soka Fit USA class here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Thank you. Now, how about that? I, I, I said Carolyn's probably ready to go right now. Uh, that, that was some hula hooping, right? Uh, <laughs> lots of comments. Lori Thorne jumped in and said, that's my teacher. Well, you are a lucky lady, Lori. Here's my suggestion, because you know I'm an entrepreneur, Carla. Uh, reach out to Keisha, and, and, and maybe what you do is have a family night, which would be really fun, and see if she could do something on a Zoom call with your family. She's an entrepreneur trying to make her business work just like so many of us during this pandemic, and I'm sure she'd be excited to hear that you, you, you heard about her on the Health Wrap, and, and is there a way that you guys could maybe do something really fun with the family there and, and, uh, and getting healthy, because that's really what it's all about, being healthy, right? That's what it's about. I know it's time for us to go. We ran over just a little bit, but we had a lot of important information to talk to the doctor about today. And, we're and a good note too, right? Yes, we're leaving on a good note too. And um, you better get your mask. Mask please, up. Mask, please get your mask. We leave you with, uh, I think she calls herself the skate kid. The skate kid. Um, mm -hmm. Love this story. You know, I'm, I'm in love with what they've done in DC in terms of the Black Lives Matter Plaza. And I thought this was just a great way for us. She's to adorable. Work. Yeah. We'll see you back next week, everybody. Please share the show with your friends. Thanks for tuning in. Stay safe. Stay alive. You're broken down and tired of living life on the merry-go-round. And you can't find a fighter. But I see it in you, so we can walk it out. Ooh. We gon' walk it out and move on day and all right. That we have each other Oh.